Uh, my name is Jenny Helin and I work at the uh, Department of Business Studies at Uppsala University in Sweden. And I just posted a, a picture in the bottom here, uh, which is, um, it's, it's the small city where I live, it's called Visby. It's on an island outside mainland Sweden. And the university is, can I use this? The university is here. So my office is actually facing the harbor. It's very beautiful. <laughs> Uh, but it's also very different from this environment, um, which, is, which is also very, very beautiful. Uh, I would like to talk today about uh, dialogue, dialogic processes, and what we call arresting moments. As this is some work we do, uh, Marie uh, and I at the moment, um, and we think it could be useful to talk about arresting moments, what it is, uh, and why it could be useful. Um, and, and how dialogue plays a role in, in this. And what I would also do, uh, spend some time on, is to try to understand these moments and, and talk about them with the help of a philosopher, let me see, push next, um, called Mikhail Bakhtin. He's a Russian philosopher, and, uh, or he used to be, <laughs> he's, he's passed away, and he devoted his life to write about dialogue, uh, but also very much about um, ethics and, uh, and also he's also a literary critic, so much about literature. And what has turned out is that even though he's not that well known in France yet, I don't know how many of you have, have, are familiar with his work? Yeah, some of you. Some of you, familiar, yeah, let's put it there. Some of you. No, but even so, what Marie found out when we talk about him is that it resonates very, very well with, with the work of Moran and, and also the complexity work that you do. So that's why we thought it could be interesting to see how it resonates and if it's, it's something different also. Uh, but what on earth then is these arresting moments, this term that we have, have come up with in, in, uh, in research? It's, I think it's those moments that when I start to talk about them, you probably know them, even though it's difficult to define. You know, it's those kind of moments when we are, for instance, we're having a talk, it could be with our partner, in a research collaboration, or a friend or something, and we're talking about something, and all of a sudden, you know, we have this, all of a sudden we just have this feeling, <coughs> oh, you know, I, I know it. We're making some kind of connection, uh, we see something, maybe we're talking about a decision that we want to make and we don't know how to move on, but all of a sudden we just feel it, you know? Wow, here it is. And, and it's not always, not always that, that we can, you know, we can you know, explicate or say, we just have this embodied feeling, this is important. And this is what we call a resting moment. Whatever that is, that is a resting moment. And I think one other thing with them is that they, when we have experienced that we have the feeling like time stops, like, you know, or we are beyond time, or we are not in chronological timing, at least. It's more lived time. And Marie and I, we have talked about it because of the conversations you have had, Maria and Marie, over the years. And we think that maybe part of why this has been so generative for you <coughs> is that you have experienced some moments like this. Uh, and in order for you to get kind of a feeling more of what it could be, I would just like to tell you a short illustration from one of my own research projects when I think we uh, uh, had one of these interesting moments. So I do my research about family-owned businesses, mostly. I think it's fascinating the way you are a family and also should also manage to, to run a business together. And, and in this case, it was a, a business that was owned by three brothers in the ninth generation. And they had three businesses together, but they were facing retirements. And there were seven cousins. Sorry, am I talking too fast? No. no. That's good. Okay. There were seven cousins in the next generation, and they wanted some of them to take over. But they didn't know exactly whom and how to make it. And none of these cousins were currently employed. And they wanted to take over both ownership and management. So let me just draw if this works. <coughs> so here are the three current owners. Oh, I have to speak in the microphone. 
and they are married. There is a wife, their wife. They are the three current owners. Oh, thanks. Yeah, can I stand up? I like that. <laughs> uh, and here are the cousins. Um, and decided, they decided to have what they call cousin meetings in order for them to find out who to take over and how to make that happen. And I, I was allowed to be part of this, to learn more about the dialogic processes during these meetings. And what it turned out was that these brothers had been in a conflict over the years. And this was, you know, this was troubling for the cousins. They were worried that they would also end up in conflict, or be, you know, part of this conflict. So for one meeting, they decided to meet the uncle then, to invite him to meet with them and talk about the conflict from his perspective. Because they have al always heard about it from their, you know, their father and mother. And they said, we want to hear more about this and we need to do it with them. And in order for us to do it, we have to meet with him alone. And they knew that this would be kind of sensitive because they never talked about the conflict. It was something that was there, but they never talked about it. So they asked me to facilitate the meeting. And I said, yes, but we need to prepare ourselves. And one of the things I want us to do is to come up with questions on beforehand that we want to ask each other. Questions that we would like to listen, you know, when the other is responding to. So we had this meeting. So it was the cousins, it was Dan, and it was me. And we was in his home, and we had coffee, and we had a relaxing time. And I sat next to Dan, and as we started, I want to read to you just a few lines from what we talked about. This is complex in reality. Uh, so as we sat there, I said to, to Dan, this one now, okay. Uh, Dan, let's see, I will start to talk to you. I think for every, I speak for everyone here when I say that we are happy to be here today. <coughs> If we start by looking back, I wonder, when you were in the same age as the cousins are today, what were your dreams back then? And what was it that made you step into the business? And then he responded, he said, uh, how old are you? Are you 15, 16? And, and what you don't know, but that we all knew, was that he was just making a joke. He didn't really respond. He knew that they were all, all older. They were all over, over 20. So he was not really responding, so I think, oh, this did not, you know, he's not really prepared to talk. But one of the cousins, he said, we are 23 to 28. You know, he just said it, he was signaling, I would like us to talk. So I thought, okay, let us move on. So I said to him again, I also have another question from the cousins. Let me read it to you. How did your relationship with your brothers during childhood influence the conflict between you as grown-ups? And all of a sudden, you know, something changed. We could just feel it. It was silence. And he sat there, and he's, you know, he's a big man. He's been responsible for the farm. His big hands, he's tall. Mm -hmm. And he sat, and he was like... And he was like, it was like he had to take energy from his whole body and like he, he was searching for words and he was like looking down and eventually he said very silently and, and quietly, he said, our relationship when we grow up, we did not have any relationship. And to us it was like, we knew there were some, you know, tensions, but non-relationship, <coughs> I couldn't understand. I think none of us could. And actually, I think he was surprised himself what he said in that moment. I was silent again because I didn't really know how to, how to go on. But, you know, I didn't understand. So I said, oh, is that your way of looking at it? Yes. But you lived under the same roof? <coughs> you never played together? No, if I was with them, they teased me. Or I was not with them. I cannot remember us ever playing. I was... What he did, I think, he just dropped his guard. He responded spontaneously out of this moment. <coughs> and it was very unexpected. And what happened here, I think, relates to what I have understood from what we talked about today, because I haven't understood everything, but it's been translating part of it. Thanks for that. Uh, that it was a unique situation. 
It was happening in the here and now. <coughs> it was relational. It was talk and action intertwined. He said those words, but it meant something. No, he was doing something with those words. They were performative as we talk about them. And the meaning from what happened here was, you know, happening in between us. <coughs> so this is to me an arresting moment. And I wouldn't say that an arresting moment needs to be like these tough kinds of relationship in order for us to be it. Whatever it is, it's up to us to define. But this kind of feeling when something, something new opens up, <coughs> something unexpected happens. So how can we then understand those? No, this is wrong. <coughs> Let me go back to Bakhtin. I think it's interesting uh, because to Bakhtin, life is dialogic. You know, one everyday sense of talking about dialogue is to say, if you, the two of you, you and me would have a chat during the break, we could say we were having a dialogue. But that is not really what Bakhtin says. He, he says it's more like we are dialogic by nature. The thing is that we you know, tend to forget, tend to rationalize, tend to rush, so maybe we forget. But we are always in dialogue. So dialogic is existential. It's a way of being. And that's what we do. So it's not like we enter dialogue or step out of dialogue. <laughs> it's a way of being. Of course we can be more or less, we can be more monologic, we cannot listen, you know, we can close ourselves. But in general, we are, as human beings, dialogic. Uh, and so how then is this dialogic come up? How does it come about? <coughs> what is this that we are? And, and what he talks about, which I think very much resonates with, with the, the, the work that I've heard Marine uh, have talked about with Moran, is that he sees it as forces. Five more minutes, yeah. He sees it as forces that are going in different directions all the time. They are closing forces and opening forces, and they are in continuous movement. And they for these forces, they will never stop, like end. They are continuous, like the sea, you know? Ebb and flow in the sea. And these forces can, for instance, be the words that we are after to each other, or it can be your bodily movement, it can be all <coughs> kinds of forces. <coughs> And another notion that's important in his work is heteroglossia. And as you can understand from this term, heteroglossia has to do with difference. Difference is very important here. We talked about it uh, yesterday and also today. That what we can offer each other in our relation, you know, when we are having, for instance, moments together, is our differences. We all are different. And what Bakhtin says, that I need you in order to be me. If we take this very setting, for instance, you can see me, I can see you, but I can't see myself. So in order for me to be me, I need you. I need you when you are nodding like you did just now. I mean, this kind of so social interplay. So we are never just an individual. Like we talked about this morning about the... the the problem with entrepreneurship research, when you talk about like a hero entrepreneur, it's always relational. It's happening in this kind of interplay. And what it says then with heteroglossia is that in any given moment, we'll have a particular set, you know, of these forces which make every moment unique. And it's time for us to stop, rec you know, being aware of this, that we are, the situations are unique. And even if we would have, for instance, <coughs> this very meeting tomorrow again, exact the same speakers, the same words, it would be something different. So no, you know, moments are exactly the same. He also talks about it as uh, dialogue as unfinalizable. So these tensions and these forces are in continuous interplay and they will continue to be like that. So we can't just say, oh, the dialogue is over, <coughs> or this is the meaning that we have, because we will, as these forces continue to play out, we will develop new meanings. The dialogue will go on. So let me just close uh, by saying some, what I think are implications based on recognizing living moments 
and this way of looking about dialogue. And I have three points there. I think they actually they are valid for both collaborative research and what we do in, in, when we do management or when we do strategizing. And, and what I say first is I think we have to, you know, we are oftentimes concerned with planning, both in research, what kind of research strategy do you have, or, and also in management, of course. Uh, but these kind of moments cannot be planned. I can't say to Marie, let us have an arresting moment tomorrow morning. Wouldn't that be nice before I fly home? No, we can't. But we can prepare ourselves for it. We can try to be open and be open for this otherness or the difference from the others. Uh, we can prepare so when we feel that there is something coming that's unique, that we are open to receive. I also think there needs to be some kind of change from talking to listening. I know. We also talked about that. I mean, we want people to be good listeners, we say that. It's a good skill. But at the same time, what's valid is often, you know, if there's someone that's a good talker or, or you feel that you have the pressure to deliver. As a, as a researcher and as a manager, you often have, you know, you have the feeling, I have to say something clever. <coughs> that's the way you do something proper. But is it really? I think what happened <coughs> in this moment was that we listened to them. And that was what, the, you know, what made it so important. And also that he listened actually to himself. And that's also part of it. To listen to different voices, including ourselves. Not forget that. And for that we need time to listen. And finally, finally, just also to, I think that we have so much focus on, on shared, you know, both in research and we would like to come up with common themes, but also in organizations we want to, people to have a shared vision, don't we? Or shared strategy, shared goals. But how on earth can we actually share the goals if we are always different? If our meaning making is unfinalizable? What would it do? Eventually we could, but then we would have no difference left. It would be very empty, you could say. What's important is to share the process, I think, and be more aware of how can we prepare ourselves to be here and now and to share this work that we do and to make it in such a way that it feels enriching for all of us that are part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Janice.